G'day friends, it's Andrew Goodall here again from Nature's Image Photography and today I'm celebrating the 5,000 subscriber milestone with chapter 10 in my Photography School series where I break down the skills of manual photography into bite-sized pieces you can easily understand. Before we get started, be sure to hit that subscribe button and join the growing army of people who like to keep in touch with my world of photography. Today's lesson is about a little notion I've invented that I call the universal starting point. For all the experts out there this might seem a bit basic, but if you're a beginner this is going to make it so much easier to make real progress on the road to manual photography. And to prove that it really works, every photo you're seeing right now was taken using the method I'm about to show you. To understand my universal starting point, first we need to recap a few things. In previous Photography School videos you've seen that exposure is controlled using a combination of aperture, shutter speed and ISO. Go back to Photography School number 8 and you'll remember that each time you change your shutter speed you can keep your exposure the same if you also make a corresponding change to your aperture. This screen only shows 9 full stop combinations of aperture and shutter speed, but these days most cameras let us change settings a third of a stop at a time, so in reality we have way more settings available to us. So if you have 20 or more aperture settings in your lens, you could, hypothetically, choose to shoot the same subject at 20 or more different shutter speeds. But that raises an obvious question. Each time you take the lens cap off your camera, do you really want to have to think about 20 different ways of taking the same photo? Or would you rather remove the guesswork by having a simple system in place to get you started? I think we all know the answer. And that's why I came up with what I'm calling the universal starting point, a simple process that you can use to kick off almost any new photo project. To understand the logic behind the method, ask yourself these two questions. First, for the majority of your photos, do you want them to be all arty and full of fancy movement effects, or do you want them to be sharp and accurate? For most people, sharp and accurate is the answer, and the key to a sharp photo is a good fast shutter speed, especially when there's action involved. Second, would you rather take all your photos on a tripod, or do you prefer to shoot handheld? Well, obviously we prefer to shoot handheld when we can, and to prevent camera shake, what do we need? A good fast shutter speed. So the truth is, despite all those different ways we can take a photo, most of the time what we really want is the fastest shutter speed we can get. So I'm going to show you the quick and easy way in manual mode to find the fastest shutter speed available. It's important to understand that the fastest shutter speed available is not necessarily the fastest shutter speed on the camera. Your camera can probably shoot at an 8,000th of a second, but unless you're pointing directly at the sun, you probably never will. Let me explain. Take a look at these pairs of shutter speeds and apertures again, and let's assume that each pair of settings gives us a correct exposure. So with the aperture wide open at f2.8, we have a correct exposure at a thousandth of a second. Now that shutter speed can go much faster, but we can't open the aperture any wider. So if we set a shutter speed faster than a thousandth of a second, our photo will be underexposed, and the faster we go, the darker it's going to get. So, for this hypothetical subject, the fastest shutter speed available for a correct exposure is a thousandth of a second. And remember, this is just one example. The fastest shutter speed will be different if you shoot in the sun, in the shade, after sunset, indoors, outdoors and so on. So it's not about the fastest shutter speed on the camera. It's about the fastest shutter speed that gives you a correct exposure. And usually, that's when we have the light meter in the middle. So after all that, it's time to explain the universal starting point. It's my quick and simple method for finding, in manual mode, the fastest shutter speed available on any camera, any lens, and in any light. Step 1. Open the aperture as wide as it can go. That can vary from lens to lens, so it might be f2.8, f3.5, f4, whatever is the smallest f-stop number for that lens. Then step 2. Check your light meter. Remember, it can switch itself off to conserve battery power, so you might need to half press the button to wake it up. And step 3, adjust the shutter speed until the light meter is in the middle. It really is that simple. I know it took me 5 minutes of explanation to get us here, but the process is incredibly easy to put into practice. Here's a quick bit of video showing you just how easy it is. So here I am in my garden. Uh, it's fairly bright, but the sun's behind a cloud, so it's not super bright at the moment. Uh, my lens is zoomed out as far as it'll go, um, and I want to find the fastest shutter speed available to me in these conditions. So step one, 
I open the aperture as wide as it'll go. That's my smallest f-stop number. You can see my light meter's gone up, telling me I'm overexposed. So I now want to adjust my shutter speed until the light meter comes back to the middle. And that brings me to 125th of a second. Now that's as fast as I can go. I can't open my aperture any wider. If I set my shutter speed any faster, the picture will be too dark. So right now, in these conditions, 125th of a second is the fastest shutter speed available to me. So now I've moved the camera into a shadier part of the garden. Uh, the light's a little bit lower. Now my lens is the same, uh, ISO 200 still. Uh, the aperture is as wide as it can go, still at f5.6. But you can see now the light meter's telling me my picture's going to be underexposed at 125th of a second. So in these darker conditions I have to slow the shutter speed down to a 30th of a second and that will give me a correctly exposed photograph in these shadier conditions. The beauty of my universal starting point is it gives you a simple routine to follow each time you pick up the camera. It doesn't matter what settings you finished up with yesterday, just remember to open the aperture wide, check the light meter and set the shutter speed and you're ready to start shooting at the fastest shutter speed available. And that speed might be very fast in bright light or much slower in low light. But whatever speed you land on, it's the fastest speed available in that moment. Now here's the really good news. Universal Starting Point isn't just a handy learning tool. These combinations of aperture and shutter speed are actually perfect for a huge range of everyday subjects. Fast shutter speeds are necessary for handheld photography, and in good light they're fast enough to freeze most kinds of action. Wide apertures produce a shallow depth of field when close up, so they're great for isolating a subject. That makes my Universal Starting Point ideal for action subjects like sports. It's great for portraits, especially when you're shooting handheld. It's perfect for close-ups of flowers, and it's ideal for wildlife, including moving subjects like birds in flight. And it's even fine for landscapes, because when you shoot with a wide-angle lens, you don't have to worry so much about depth of field. You'll be amazed when you discover just how many subjects can be shot using a combination of a wide aperture and a fast shutter speed. So my universal starting point takes a lot of the guesswork out of choosing settings, and it will help you kick off on almost any new project. But there's a reason why I call it a starting point. It's not the solution to every photography problem, it's just a great place to start. First of all, putting your light meter in the middle is simply what the camera thinks is a correct exposure. But if you've watched my earlier videos, you know there are plenty of situations where the camera can get it wrong. When your subject is much brighter than the background, or much darker for that matter, the camera can be fooled into giving you the wrong exposure. These are times when you have to be smarter than your camera. If the first shot is too bright, you might need to try again with a faster shutter speed to darken the exposure down. So the universal starting point doesn't always give you a perfect exposure, but it gets you close enough that you can easily figure out what to do next to get it right. The other thing to remember is that not all subjects want a shallow depth of field. Sometimes you might want a bit more. Sometimes you might want a lot more. And you don't always want to freeze action. Sometimes we like to slow the shutter speed down to create some motion blur. At times like these you might choose to use the starting point as exactly that, a place to start, and then see where your creativity takes you from there. And finally, I want to remind you of something we covered in my video on ISO. What if you're on 200 ISO and the fastest shutter speed you can get isn't fast enough? Well that's when it's time to bring in a higher ISO to allow you to increase the shutter speed. As I mentioned in that video, you may not change the ISO all that often, but it's important to remember it's there. So, that's my story of the universal starting point. This isn't something that was ever taught to me, it's something I came up with myself when I could see some of my students getting overwhelmed by all those settings and needing a way to simplify things. My workshop students absolutely love this notion, and I hope you find it helpful too. You just need to get outside and practice to see just how effective it is. Before you go, don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. I'm Andrew Goodall. Thanks for watching.